Hello and welcome to Cover Story. This week we have with us former INB Minister Manish Tiwari, who still remains one of the most articulate voices of Congress today. Welcome to NewsX, Manish. Thank you, Priya. And Manish, I want to talk to you about a lot of things about the state of the Congress today, about the state, the new government that has come in. But I'm going to begin with the current controversy in which I think you've played a role in dousing the fire. About this whole controversy about Smithy Rani's age, hasn't the Congress scored a self-goal in bringing up the degree of the HRD minister? Well, I think, uh, Priya, there are two distinct issues out here. The first is uh, with regard to the qualifications of a particular individual. Uh, to hold a particular job or not. And I think uh, that is really the prerogative of the Prime Minister as to whom does he want to appoint uh, as a minister and what portfolio would he like to assign to him. Uh, so therefore in that context, I think uh, it is wise to possibly make a distinction uh, between uh, literacy, uh, education and intelligence. So therefore, uh, I do not really think that uh, literacy or degrees uh, is the sole qualification uh, which uh, entitles you to be uh, a part of the Council of Ministers. But then there is this related issue with regard to alleged discrepancies uh, in the affidavits which the HRD minister has filed. So therefore, there is a particular set of qualifications uh, which were uh, articulated in the 2004 affidavit. Then there is a set of qualifications uh, which were uh, represented in the 2009 or whenever she came uh, to the Rat Sabha and a set of educational qualifications when she contested again from 2014. Now there seems to be an alleged discrepancy and I think it is important for the HRD minister uh, to really explain those and uh, not brush it under the carpet. So therefore, I think these are two distinct issues which uh, fall into two different buckets. Sure enough, but is, I mean, the second issue I think is a more valid issue, but hasn't the Congress, as I said earlier, scored a self-goal by bringing the first issue? I mean, everybody is saying you're sore losers. As you said yourself, it's the Prime Minister's prerogative whether he wants to make a graduate the HRD minister or not, really, you know, the Congress. To point that out, to make that the debate rather than the second issue, I think the Congress has been, uh, I mean, you've underscored your own attack, haven't you? Well, uh, I, I made my views uh, very clear and uh, I said that the attack on the BJP government uh, has to be on substantive policy issues uh, rather than on individuals. Uh, so therefore, uh, I would tend to agree with you that we need to in future uh, concentrate on the substantive policy uh, aberrations uh, which uh, uh, the, the BJP uh, would possibly uh, commit when, uh, as they go along with the task of governance and juxtapose it against the positions which they have taken while they were in opposition. But which brings us to, you know, the person who said this also, you know, it was said by someone who's in charge of the communications, who also known to be close to Rahul. We were seen, you know, as the young brigade, Ajay Makan, coming in. So, uh, especially because the Congress doesn't clarify on these issues, whose point of view was that? Do we take it that the Congress leadership, uh, Ajay Makan's attack, had the backing of the Congress leadership? Well, I am not going to go into that question for the simple reason that, uh, as I understand the process, uh, the chairperson of the media department uh, is quite uh, competent and empowered in order to take a view uh, on uh, what really has to be uh, the party line on a particular issue or what are the issues which need to be raised. You know, everything is not essentially and always cleared with the uh, leadership. That's been my experience uh, in the five years that I spent as a spokesperson in the media department. Uh, but as I... Uh, uh, earlier underscored, I would like to reiterate that uh, if uh, we were to concentrate on substantive policy questions, I think that would be a wiser way of doing things. 
And uh, also, how does the Congress work, you know, because uh, we seem to have the BJP, which seems to have, you know, got its act together, they've got a huge mandate anyway. The Congress is still getting its, op now we have to play the role of an opposition. The Congress is still getting its act together. You know, you have Vajay Makhan saying one thing, Abhishek Manu Singh, we trying to uh, make another point in the afternoon. Then you're coming in the middle uh, and trying to, you know, uh, I would say you did some damage control. So when is the Congress going to speak in one voice? Well, I think uh, before that, uh, it is important, Priya, to really uh, scour, scour the uh, landscape uh, or traverse the landscape between 2004 and 2014, uh, 2014 uh, before we really come to this question as to how the Congress works. But to answer it uh, off the bat, uh, since that seems to be at the top of your mind, uh, I do not see that there is a contradiction or a contradistinction uh, between what the chairperson of the media department or a particular spokesperson uh, or, uh, let us suppose, a Congress activist like we says. Uh, it's more a question of nuances. Okay, what's going to happen now in Parliament, per se, you know, because uh, we have the BJP coming up with a huge mandate. Congress uh, has as many members in the House as the BJP has in the government, you know, that's the joke. The Council of Ministers is as much as the Congress party. So who's going to be, most of the articulate voices are outside Parliament. Well, who's going to be the biggest uh, speakers in Parliament? Well, uh, let's not forget the fact that there was a time when the BJP had uh, two members in uh, the Lok Sabha. And uh, between 85 and 89, from two they came up to 88 and by 1991 they came up uh, to 120. Uh, so therefore, you know, politics at times uh, can uh, play a very strange hand uh, and what seems to be the, uh, the, 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 the inevitable uh, you know, uh, is, is totally upturned uh, by, by events and circumstances as they unfold. So I have no doubts at all that both inside Parliament and outside Parliament in the Lok Sabha, in the Raj Sabha and, uh, you know, in the larger public space, uh, the Congress would be an effective opposition voice. The, the real opposition or the real discourse, the real debate uh, is in the public space, is in the electronic media, uh, is in the print media. And as I keep telling friends that uh, if uh, uh, Mr. Arvind Kejriwal could actually uh, create a political party virtually out of uh, television studios, so therefore I do not think, you know, there is a lack of platforms for the Congress to really be raising issues. So the Congress is going to be an opposition on the television studios, I guess. Well, I think... The so main you, opposition is going to be well, all, all there on the TV well, studios. Well, well, I think if you... Uh, look at the discourse as it has unfolded, you know, over the past uh, uh, over 20 years as uh, India has liberalized with 415 odd news and current affairs channels, with assemblies and parliaments being totally non-functional, assembly sessions are hardly convened and if they are convened, they are of a very limited uh, duration. Parliament has been dysfunctional over the last, you know, couple of uh, not sessions, but last couple of terms of parliament. So therefore, the real, uh, the meat of the discourse is uh, now uh, in, 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 in the public domain and with social media being the added dimension, whereby you, know, you have the ability to be able to articulate a point of view uh, without restraint or responsibility at times, you know, uh, you know in, a, in a second. So I, I don't think uh, there is a lack of platforms or, uh, and I'm sure that the uh, BJP uh, will be fairly generous with the number of issues that they would give to the opposition to use these platforms. You know, Manish, you spoke about Twitter. This is very interesting because we are seeing, you know, right now what's happening is because Modi is so active on Twitter, I don't even think he needs a media advisor. We're getting exactly what he's doing since the morning. We know he's met the PM official, he's having a cabinet meeting, whatever he's done. The Congress, on the other hand, is still uh, functioning in uh, silence. I mean, uh, when are you guys going to get your act together on Twitter? Well, I think, uh, Priya... Or on it, communication, more well, than Twitter. Well, I think, Priya, it is also uh, possibly a hangover of the campaign mode in which uh, the BJP has been in. Uh, you know, this uh, over-aggressiveness which you see on the social media, once uh, issues of governance uh, start really impinging upon and uh, taking the time of the Prime Minister and hard questions start getting asked, you know, you would find then there would be a retreat uh, from not only the social media, 
but even the uh, the forms of other media because the euphoria of victory can very quickly give away uh, to the uh, humdrum of governance and so at that point in time it is all of you who would start asking questions that hey you know there was this was a set of people who were you know very active and you know tried to portray that they were very transparent and open and suddenly they have become opaque so let the rigors of governance really take over and then you know we will uh, find out as to whether they remain actually as open and transparent as they claim to be but in terms of the opposition shouldn't you all be more active uh, or more you know we are still waiting you taking too long to react that's the other thing you know because uh, because of social media the reaction has become much more instant than even in the age of tv sound bites uh, well i think uh, there is also a logic of uh, politics and the logic of politics entails that if when a new government is formed you know they need to be given a reasonable amount of time uh, to try and uh, articulate whatever their uh, Uh, policies or whatever their programs are and then you know the opposition starts critiquing them you are right what new media has done or social media has done has reduced that time lag completely so you have new media which functions you know on a second to second basis you have electronic media which functions 24 into 7 and you have print media which is now trying to compete you know by having 24 into 7 websites so therefore you know there is an information overload and 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 everybody has to sort of deal uh, with this uh, specter and i agree with you that as an opposition you know we need to be you know much more nimble you know much more uh, quick footed uh, in order to be able to change the discourse and in order to uh, see that our viewpoint gets out as quickly as possible because you know whenever we spoke to people about the reasons for the loss a lot of you have said it's because of communication problems you know we thought uh, we they would say that you did the policies but you couldn't communicate them better so that should be one of the first areas that the congress should be looking into with due respect i do not agree with that point of view communication or perception is the alter ego of reality you uh, cannot spin a reality beyond a point after all uh, perception is about uh, the underlying the reality and the fact is that it was not a crisis of communication it was really a crisis of credibility and the inflection point came in the november of 2010 when the telecom wars peaked with the uh, the cndg report and uh, our inability to handle the fallout of that in terms of the manner in which it hit the credibility of the government uh, that is you know what really created the perception problem and therefore you know you could not spin that reality in terms of perception uh, in a manner whereby you could completely surmount it and override it and that's why i'm saying that if you look at it in a perspective see from 2004 to 2008 your rights based entitlement programs were also welcomed by the people because the economy was growing at 8.5 to 9% in 2008 when the great economic meltdown took place because of the counter cyclical measures you still continued to grow 2009 when you came back into office again and you withdrew those counter cyclical measures and the eurozone crisis came and the indian economy tanked that's when you know questions started being raised with regard to government spending on the rights based entitlement programs which i think you know were in 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 in, in the in the in the correct uh, direction coupled with that you know was the peaking of the telecom wars and uh, you know the commonwealth uh, issues etc etc so therefore if you really look at it in a perspective what did the congress in you know not withstanding the damage control which mr chitambaram tried to do when he became finance minister again uh, in 2012 was the economy which alienated the middle class and it this became more of a battle uh, rather than between the bjp and the congress between corporate india and the congress and that is why i say that this was the rockefeller moment of indian politics this is the second teutonic power shift uh, in indian politics 
the first 91 when liberalization happened and economic power went from government hands into public hands into private hands and this is the first time when corporate India made a very very concerted bid for political power and they did not place their bet on a political party they placed their bet on one man and unfortunately uh, well they succeeded and I, that's why I say that this is the Rockefeller moment of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of Indian politics and this is going to have very grave implications as we go along. But why could you also you know you may, uh, one another problem was the leadership problem so why couldn't one Mohan have seen this coming and done some course correction because you know are you talking with the benefit of hindsight but he could have seen that something is going wrong this is too much emphasis on doles and uh, uh, rights based politics not enough is being done for the middle class did any time anybody raise this warning signal? Well I think uh, those warning signals were all there for everybody to see and uh, by 2012 and by 2012 uh, when uh, Mr. Chitambaram came back as finance minister and uh, Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh and uh, the finance minister started the cost correction and you then the cabinet committee on investments was constituted, the environment bottlenecks started getting unlocked. You know, perhaps it was too late in the day and the uh, perception uh, had already consolidated. So those three critical years from 2009 to 2012 when the counter-cyclical measures were uh, withdrawn, the, uh, the, the global economy went into a second dip and our inability to launch the second generation reforms, you know, coupled with, of course, uh, the other attendant perceptional problems uh, which came up, uh, really did us in. So therefore, uh, I, for one, do not believe that this was a problem of communication. It was a crisis of credibility and you cannot spin reality beyond a certain point and I think that's something which all of us need to understand if we want to do a real rigorous introspection about the causes of this defeat and then draw the right lessons and uh, look at what the way forward is. But is there any such introspection going to happen or are we going to have another Moiley committee report that's going to you know gather dust? Well I think uh, when you do come to uh, a, a, a point where uh, your numbers uh, dwindle, uh, you, there is a cause for very, very serious introspection. There because should be a cause. There, there, is is a, a cause. There, there, there is a cause for a very serious introspection. You need to critically look at uh, the governance paradigm over the past 10 years. Uh, take credit for what you d you've done right. Accept responsibility for what you've done wrong. And then, you know, see as to what the organizational weaknesses also were and as, as to whether the synergy between the government and the organization was there or it was missing and then try and uh, take it forth because already you are having you know opportunities uh, falling into your lap for example the signal uh, which uh, uh, this government has sent to the permanent establishment in Pakistan and to their instrumentalities and the non-state actors is that whatever they had been saying for the past 10 years in terms of terror and talks not going hand in hand that was really shooting the breeze and for them the moment they form government you know it's business as usual and terror and talks can go hand in hand but there is a difference between a jingo opposition leader where you do be jingoistic and a prime minister where you have to toe the statesman line well in the sense that you see uh, the fact is that when you are ultra jingoistic when you are in the opposition and then you do a perceived u turn when uh, you are on the first day uh, of being in government, the signal that you send uh, to people across the border, because let's remember that India, Pakistan, while they're bonded in geography, you know, are serrated and seared, you know, by the kind of history that we have uh, amongst us. So under those circumstances, after the Herat attack, the, the message which unfortunately has gone out is that whatever was said in the last 10 years was pure rhetoric it was shooting the breeze and this is a government you know which will be prone or can be uh, pressurized and i and it has implications for national security and i do hope and god forbid that my words do not come true
but uh, you know uh, you also casting the voice of doom because that handshake was worth a thousand pictures i mean that was a moment you know you had a, a very subtle show of strength when you had all the heads of sar countries coming in just to watch the swearing in of an indian prime minister that was a moment that made a lot of people proud also well in the sense that uh, you know your monroe doctrine in terms of the manner in which you deal with your uh, neighbors is been uh, critiqued uh, for its uh, big brother approach so therefore you know whether it has sent out the right signals or whether the neighbors were being just courteous and circumspect at the same time you know the jury is still out i think if we start patting ourselves on the back a little too early in the day we would be making a, a, a mistake but in so far as the principal impediment to peace uh, and stability in south asia is concerned that is the relationship between india between india and pakistan you know i am afraid that the signals according to me which have gone out to the people who really matter in pakistan are extremely ominous from india's point of view okay moving on to domestic politics and i'm going back to the cabinet uh, you know we had a now a lot of people congress people are saying in retrospect that the younger lot should have been given a chance sooner you know i think you also came into the government much later you know towards the end of upa2 really or the uh, middle of upa2 uh, a lot of people are given independent charge you know like yourself like uh, manish uh, like sachin milendra uh, were made uh, in charge of departments at a much later age here Uh, modi has gone off you know given it's a lean and green cabinet lot of novices but they've been given huge uh, uh, you know uh, they've been given charge of important portfolios it seems he's grooming a team from day one which is what the congress didn't do well uh, you know a uh, profile or a bio data uh, is really a monster which you carry on your back and uh, i think uh, you know this emphasis on youth is really overrated and i don't think that if you really look at the upa in a perspective you can say that the older ministers performed worse and the younger ministers performed better because uh, if you if you if you sort of put it in context you know some of the most hard working ministers in the upa in addition to the prime minister was the finance minister was even someone like uh, you know mr jairam ramesh Uh, who handled uh, a, a, a very huge portfolio there's a whole argument that jairam ramesh should have been curbed should have been curbed well in the sense that's a different matter but i'm talking in terms of you know people who uh, brought to the table you know a certain uh, experience mr veerappa moili was there you know and there were various names i can you know i i can take so therefore i think this emphasis on youth is really overrated because what this country and i think that's the lesson that we need to draw from the 2014 elections what this country and especially the young people are looking for is professionalism is competence is efficiency is the ability to be able to deliver and i don't think age has anything to do with no that. absolutely not but it has the, what i was talking about is grooming a team you know which is uh, for manmohan singh most of his cabinet colleagues didn't even treat him as a leader didn't see him as you know we have uh, sanjay barus book which say that arjun singh manmohan singh was upset a lot of cabinet ministers didn't even get up when he walked in didn't give him the respect he wanted now modi at least you know he's kept the old people out he's kept the old guard out people who he could not give orders to like an advani or a joshi but he's got a younger lot and he's made 75 the cut off age and he's grooming a leadership which is what should have happened with all of you maybe a rahul should have come in let him groom his team or let manmohan but there was no team that was groomed well first of all my limited experience of uh, being in the cabinet and i had the good fortune of being able to attend every cabinet meeting mm -hmm. i think the prime minister was accorded due respect by all his colleagues while at least while i was there there was never an occasion when the prime minister walked into a cabinet meeting and every cabinet minister whether he was young or old did not stand up as a mark of respect so i i i i do not know as to where mr sanjay baru uh, really gets it but or maybe it was before my time yeah, but, but, but 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 uh, you know uh, coming as it does uh, what you characterize as building a team in the case of the current prime minister i would say is sowing the seeds of rebellion after all these are people who have spent a lifetime in the bharatiya janata party uh they have you know invested their time uh, energy and their entire life uh into that party and to to think that you know they are going to uh, keep quiet 
know, I, 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 I have my own doubts. And then, uh, for example, I think one person who deserved it, not because he is a friend of mine, you know, though we go back 30 years in life, but given his sheer political experience, who deserved to be in government was Rajiv Pratap Rudi. So I, I do not know as to why or what were the compulsions that a person who had proved himself, you know, both while he was in government and in the party, he was a worthy adversary, you know, needed to be kept out. So therefore, I think there was more factional play, you know, which was uh, at play rather than really an attempt to build a team. But the more faction play, I'm told there is one faction at play, which is the Modi faction. You know, you can say it's dictatorial, but that seems to be what we are. So that is precisely what I'm saying. You but know, it what, also goes towards team building and loyalty building. I mean, that, that is exactly what I'm saying. That you see, when you are prime minister, uh, you need to carry everybody along, and if you are going to have uh, a lot of sulking people uh, in your party, then I'm afraid that uh, this would uh, flower and germinate. You know, one day, it may happen in six months, it may take a longer time, because I do not think that most of these guys, you know, who are really possibly at the end of their political careers, God give them a long life, are going to keep quiet for a very long time. Okay, we're going to end now on a um, personal note. We've discussed uh, what's next for the Congress, but what next for Manish? What is... Uh... Well, I go back to my legal practice, unfortunately. Because of an illness at a very wrong time, I could not contest. And uh, that was a know, winning seat. Well, in the sense, uh, I, 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 you know, that would be a deep and enduring regret. So I go back to my legal practice, and I'll keep on doing, you know, whatever responsibility is assigned to me by the party. You know, I have spent over uh, three decades, almost 34 years, in the Congress Party now. So therefore, it has become a part of me and whatever responsibility the Congress President assigns to me, I would be more than willing and I would be more than happy, you know, in order to see that I can perform to the best of my ability. So we're going to end on that note and wish you all the best. Thank you, Priya. Thank, Thank you. you for talking to us.